So now it's time to meet our keynote speaker, joining us from the United States for a behind the scenes look at a 22 year adventure of hard work, luck, technology and excitement at Ellicraft. Let's welcome to the 2020 RSGB convention online, Eric Swartz, WA6HHQ. Eric, you'll have to imagine the huge round of applause that's taking place now. Uh, it must be the middle of the night for you. Where are you? Yeah, it's about uh, one oh three in the morning here, so I have a little bit of caffeine keeping me going here too. So hopefully, uh, <laughs> that won't make me talk too fast, but as I usually do. But uh, it, I'm looking forward to it. it. Should be fun. Well, you're very welcome, Eric. The floor is yours. Well, thanks, Jim, and I'm glad to be with everybody uh, this morning. Uh, welcome, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you this morning. Hopefully, uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, rather than giving a um, heavy technical talk or, uh, of course, a sales talk or anything like that, I'm um, going to give you a little bit of a background on Ellicraft since we've actually been around, uh, as the title you can see up, up on the screen there, uh, 22 years now. It's a little scary that uh, we've made it this far. Uh, but it's uh, it been quite a, a journey and a, and a fun ride. So I wanted to uh, give you a little history, walk you through uh, from uh, Wayne and I when we started the company and uh, you know, sort of with some pictures of products and, uh, and other things along the way. And of course, we'll talk about the K4 a little bit at the end, of course, because that's uh, certainly been at the top of a lot of questions we've been getting lately. So uh, thanks very much for coming. And I wish I was there in person. I uh, was out last year at the, uh, the National Ham Fest and enjoyed myself uh, quite a bit meeting people and talking to everybody. And uh, certainly we'll be trying to get back out to, uh, to one of the shows uh, as soon as we can when they start letting us do that again. Uh, things out here in California have uh, calmed down a bit. It's been a bit smoky, as you probably heard in uh, California from some of the fires. Fortunately, uh, nothing impacted us directly at the uh, factory. We were far enough from them, but we did have some employees and uh, other folks uh, affected. And uh, that uh, certainly disrupted things for a while, but we're back to normal now, which is great. And uh, it had been running at full speed. So I'd like to talk about 22 years of Ellicraft and uh, uh, have some fun along the way here, uh, giving you a feel for uh, how we started the company. Uh, some of our philosophy and how we actually uh, run the business um, and uh, and let you see uh, give you a little peek of what's coming up here with the k4 course at the end um, let me get set up here so first of all who are we i think uh, many folks may uh, be familiar with wayne and myself but just a little bit of background um, both of us actually got our ham radio license uh, in california uh, we didn't know each other uh, back in 1971 when we were all 14 years old uh, Wayne's original call was WN6HQH, interesting enough. Mine was the novice version of my current call, WN6HHQ. Um, I used to joke with people, it was California karma that we would eventually bump into each other and start a company. Of course, uh, Wayne changed his call to something uh, much shorter, N6KR. And I used to joke with him because he's uh, mostly a QRP guy that he does get on at 100 watts too. Uh, so we used, when you operated field day, I would use the phonetics N6 kilowatt radio, which would uh, drive him crazy, but it worked great for, uh, for the contests. Uh, Wayne's a very good uh, hardware and firmware designer, uh, worked uh, in Silicon Valley in a number of places uh, uh, prior to us meeting. Um, his degree actually is in cognitive science um, and also uh, has some computer science as part of that too. Uh, an excellent designer, been designing radios actually since uh, really when he first got his ham radio license. So he's got uh, this incredible skills that, uh, and creative this in terms of radio design. Um, myself, um, I'm from the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area originally, so which is very close to where we're located, which is just outside of Silicon Valley on the uh, coastal uh, area of Monterey Bay for uh, Ellicraft. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, went back east to school on the East Coast, and then uh, came back out uh, as an engineer and uh, worked my way up through uh, engineering design and uh, management and startups and all the usual Silicon Valley story. Uh, and uh, started uh, another company prior to uh, Ellicraft and then uh, went crazy back uh, when I got together with Wayne and, and started this company. So I've uh, been having a lot of fun uh, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that area in that time. Uh, my background, I would say, is design engineering and business management. Uh, Wayne and I, of course, designed the uh, K2 together um, and also helped him on some of his original QRP rigs for the NorCal QRP club, I'll show you in a second. And uh, it really, uh, our philosophies of design and also uh, starting a business meshed quite well. So it was one of those things we, we figured out pretty quickly that uh, we worked well together and uh, we've been enjoying uh, working together now for 22 years and, uh, and certainly growing the company as we did that. Um, it all started around this little radio. Uh, some of you folks may have this. This is a NorCal 40, which uh, Wayne designed actually uh, for the NorCal QRP club back in the mid 90s, I think. 
Um, and this is a single board design with no uh, interconnect cables or anything, uh, clean mechanical design, uh, simple front panel, back panel, and U-shaped top and bottom covers with, uh, of course, all through hole design. But a pretty good performance uh, four watt uh, QRP radio on 40 meters. Um, I happened to uh, pick it up at a ham fest, which and I had not met Wayne at that time or even heard of him. Uh, on a lark uh, because I've been chasing DX with much bigger radios and a friend and I thought this would be fun to do something on QRP so we went uh, went that route but uh, we uh, were both down front my friend uh, Stan uh, N6ULU at the time and myself were down in Monterey California down near Carmel just in the southern part of Monterey Bay 30 minutes from here back in 1994 and we both picked up a couple of these kits um, actually ordered them from the uh, club stand there at the uh, ham fest and uh, built them and actually were chasing each other, trying to work countries the next year. And uh, both of us uh, actually got over a hundred countries uh, at four watts. And uh, unfortunately, Stan had the bigger antenna and he worked 120. <laughs> I helped put that antenna up, so that's my fault. Um, but in 1994, um, around that time, I started uh, just for fun um, on every first Saturday, I think it was uh, of each month, the NorCal QRP club met out uh, after uh, a, a local ham radio flea market out in Livermore on the eastern side of Silicon Valley and uh, ended up bumping into Wayne there at the club meetings uh, which were held at a place called the California Burger uh, restaurant uh, fast food restaurant uh, hamburger place that uh, the club would take over in the mornings and they uh, we get breakfast there and have people bring their projects and things it was mostly a builders club and operating but uh, we'd meet people there and uh, have you know, a big social event too. So we uh, met there and through the next couple of years operating field day together, we'd brainstorm uh, middle of the night uh, radio ideas for the ultimate field day radio. And uh, actually that's how the design for the K2 came about is we uh, wanted low current drain, reasonably actually very good performance because you have more than one transmitter usually nearby. And uh, one thing led to another and uh, we convinced ourselves we actually could uh, sell a product around this. So we uh, first uh, sort of floated it before we actually started the company in 1997 at the um, West Coast uh, AWRL uh, Ham Fest uh, called Pacificon outside of Silicon Valley and uh, managed to have a, get a good crowd. We had about 50 or 70 people in the room and uh, we had a little projector showing the slides of this uh, proposed radio we hadn't built yet. And uh, people thought we were crazy, but we, uh, we gave them a feel for where we were going and uh, showed them how the radio was put together, including internal pictures like this. Though we did not put the uh, 12 volt internal battery at that mounting, uh, we discovered that if you drop the radio, a, uh, a, a sealed lead acid battery can do a lot of damage inside a radio. So we ended up with, for the people who bought internal batteries on the K2, mounting it to the top cover, which worked out fine. But uh, we had a little foam mock up, actually real size, with printed out uh, color circuit board uh, drawings on the uh, cards. And a lot of things changed my original design. We did not do vertical plug in cards like you saw here. We um, actually went to um, more horizontal and, and uh, you know, plug-in modules inside. But uh, overall, the basic concept was the same from the start and uh, led to the K2. Uh, early on, uh, typical Silicon Valley guys, I lived over in the Monterey Bay. Wayne lives about an hour north of me uh, over in the San Francisco Bay Area on the peninsula near Stanford and Palo Alto and uh, I think he, in uh, San Carlos, he lives in Belmont. And uh, we would meet halfway at a restaurant called the, uh, the Good Earth and uh, this was the first circuit boards that we had made for the K2. And I was giving him a set so he could build a set and I would build a set and we'd get this thing working. When we started the company, we uh, talked a lot about what that meant, you know, what we wanted to do um, to get the company going. And really a couple things. And having been through some startups in Silicon Valley, I had some pretty strong uh, beliefs of what worked, what didn't work. We made a lot of them, you know, we all make a lot of mistakes and you learn from those. But certainly you've got to work hard. Um, not a lot of sleep sometimes, uh, but uh, the energy and the adrenaline keeps you going sometimes. One really important thing is uh, whenever you start a business and something that's been your hobby, you've got to realize it's not a hobby anymore for you. I mean, you have, certainly have the hobby aspect when you're, you're doing off on your own playing with it, but inside the business, uh, you've got to think of it as a business. Um, and that's a different mindset. Uh, you still have fun with it. You still enjoy it. But uh, you've got to pay attention to the uh, cash flow, um, you know, getting good people on board. Uh, really looking at what your costs are and bringing a product to market and pricing it accordingly or you won't survive once you try to grow and you start bringing overhead for people to build it for you and manage accounting and and uh, keep track of purchasing and you name it and that adds a lot more than when you're in a basement just buying it by yourself so uh, you have to design the profitability and from the start we did that uh, cash flow uh, you always you know you can go bankrupt uh, and 
uh, you know, show a profit, but not have the cash flow to support the business. We uh, managed to support the company uh, pretty much with internal financing from day one. We haven't had to go outside for bank, bank financing or, or venture capital. So it, uh, it's been a nice steady growth for us. And actually, you can go through the ups and downs of the economy when that happens if you've got your own uh, company cash balance that you saved up over the years, which we have. And that, that's helped a lot. Obviously, good employees. Um, we also hire them outside. Uh, with the internet, we can have people virtual. And we did this even starting back in, in 2000. Our first uh, customer support engineer was in Arizona, uh, Gary Surrency, um, who was actually helping out customers on our email discussion list. And we needed somebody when it was too much work for myself to uh, keep doing customer support and grow the business. I was the first customer support guy, I guess. And uh, Gary came on board and operated from down there for, gosh, about 18 years for us before he retired. So we have engineers up and down the West Coast um, and virtual organization. And lastly, we took our customers and uh, the first hundred customers that were uh, willing to buy K2's uh, site unseen as we designed them uh, became evangelists for the product. Uh, and that really is from a marketing standpoint was wonderful because obviously uh, word of mouth is important for ham radio. A couple of other startup ingredients. Uh, we used the internet for viral marketing. Uh, we didn't even have any print ads for the first year, uh, just a web page and uh, also uh, the discussion groups, uh, we did tech support, advertising, everything that way. And it uh, helped us get out and uh, get bootstrapped off the ground quickly. Obviously stay focused, uh, methodically built our product line, you know, one add on module at a time. We had fun, you have to keep doing that or it wouldn't be worthwhile doing either. And you, certainly if you're having fun, you project that to your customers and that makes it fun for you guys too. Um, we listen and we always are adding things to the products. People that know us uh, realize that you can't do everything that we hear, but. Uh, we pay attention and try to improve the products continually over the whole lifetime of the product. Um, if you have a customer that's not happy, make sure you leave them happy afterwards. So we always uh, will bend over backwards and even lose money on a transaction if it's, uh, you know, it's our fault, certainly, or even if it's in a gray area, we want to make sure we err on the side of you, not, uh, not leave you unhappy. So we work really hard at that. Also, you got to move fast. You design stuff. Uh, we build it. We break it in testing and get it out there um, to market as fast as we can. So. Uh, you cycle it as much as you can early on. Don't be try to make it perfect uh, the first day. You get it going, test it, and have some field testers, find the problems, get those fixed, cycle it, get it out. Obviously, try to design great products. And that's if you enjoy it and we have a lot of fun and I'll hopefully have some good designs out there and it's worked out well for us, uh, you get some successful products. And of course, you got to work even harder uh, after you get those first products out and you have to outdo it for the next one. Here's the K2 prototype from 1998. Um, this uh, was the first version of it. Again, the philosophy here was try to eliminate uh, cable harnesses like the old Heath kits used to have, so you didn't have to do a lot of wire soldering. All the boards plugged into each other. That's the front panel with the push buttons mounted on it, liquid crystal display. Also, another board behind it had the microprocessor and audio control logic on it. We ended up actually expanding that board to the full width of the radio as we added features uh, as we finished up the design. But the basic concept uh, was pretty much what you see here. And we brought this to a NorCal QRP meeting to show it off along with a couple of working prototypes as we got them going. And here's the first ones, Wayne, when uh, back when we had more hair, um, was showing off um, the first unpainted K2. This is back in 1998 um, in April. So before, I think, I think we took these to Dayton that year actually, if I remember correctly. Um, either 98, yeah, 98. Um, and we uh, showed them some people there too, but uh, the uh, unpainted versions we had there, these are operating and we actually were working stations on the hood of my uh, little SUV there. And uh, and it was quite interesting. So this is at the California Burger. You can see it in the background on the picture there. Um, for those of you that know some of the local QRP crowd and those guys, um, Dave Fifield over on the uh, right side, actually uh, with the glasses for, for, from the UK. Uh, Chuck Adams in, in that uh, over in the red uh, uh, sweatshirt over in the far distance there, very fast CW operator, uh, sharp guy, actually a rocket scientist, and uh, K7QO, I think is his current call. Uh, Vern Adams of Super Antennas is sort of in the middle with uh, suspenders over his yellow t-shirt. Um, so there are interesting folks there in those days, but uh, had a good crowd and we were showing off our toys and uh, we uh, got a lot of new, uh, new customers uh, when we did that uh, from the crowd. We also operated field day together that year. I had two K2s and actually this is a picture from another group that was next to us operating about a mile away. And they couldn't figure out how uh, with our radios we were able to operate a few kilohertz away from them on CW and not get wiped out by their big 100 watt or even 500 watt signal. Um, the K2s had a pretty good rejection of adjacent signals and they came by and check us out and we were showing off the insides when they took this picture of us. 
So that uh, memorialized uh, some dual K2 operation for field day with us. And so in 1998 uh, is when we uh, first uh, finished designing the K2 and we shipped our first K2s in January, I think the 22nd of 99. And I had gone full-time, I think in July of 98. And Wayne went full-time right as we started shipping uh, full-time. We actually got in the cover of Japanese CQ magazine. So we sort of uh, reversed uh, the radio invasion back that direction. That's showing some of Wayne's earlier QRP designs and the K2 there that we did together on the cover of theirs in, that, in September of 98. And this actually is Wayne and I were designed, uh, designed the radio to be shipped in uh, UPS, uh, uh, USPS, excuse me, uh, priority mailboxes, the standard, uh, they're free, which is important to us back then. And we, uh, we basically uh, packaged up the first 100 and shuttled them down to the local post office in several trips. And they got used to us after that. First, they wanted to know what all these boxes were for. And we said, oh, we're starting a company. And they sort of smiled. And we came back with another load and another load and another load. And, and they got the idea that we actually were doing something serious. And they, uh, they got eventually ended up picking them up from us. But uh, it was fun to watch that grow. This, uh, after we moved out of my basement where we built those first 100 K2s um, in uh, 1999, this is our first office, not uh, very auspicious, but in Aptos, my town where I live, about uh, eight miles north of where the factory currently is uh, in Watsonville, just south of us. Um, and we had uh, two small suites, my palatial office here. You can see my office there, the U-shaped uh, folding tables put together with the computer on it our conference table and another table across uh, for our office manager and salesperson. We also had another room that was our manufacturing room where we kitted up the K2s and we had a little, uh, basically a large closet for the inventory at the time. At that time, we kept a lot of the parts inventory in little parts drawers versus uh, the way we do it now with a uh, large uh, inventory area with you know parts bins and everything else. But uh, we packed and shipped and did everything from this room for a number of years on all of the K2 and uh, K1 and further products out there. That was in 2000. Also in 2000, and we started going to some TAM fests um, outside of uh, the local ones. Um, and uh, this is at Fort Tuthill, Arizona. Again, a QRP crowd, though, a number of them were buying the 100 watt version ultimately from us too, of the K2. And these guys surprised us. They didn't tell us they were all bringing their built up K2s that they built. And they uh, lined them all up and got us in a group picture for that. So we have fun with these things too. But uh, it was nice to see the enthusiasm of the customers. We were starting to realize we actually had something that, that was, it was starting to take off a little bit. We also had some crazy customers. Um, this is the first K2 in Antarctica, excuse me. Um, this uh, person uh, called us up uh, and said he wanted to buy a K2. And we said, no problem, we can get it out to you. We have some in stock. He says, yeah, I need to get it quickly because I'm leaving for a week in Antarctica. I'm gonna build it and take it with me. I said, are you sure you wanna do that? Uh, you gotta make sure you get everything together quickly and get it working. But he did and took it down with him and worked a lot of stations. And he sent us this QSL card. Uh, from down there. So he uh, it was certainly our, our first, I guess, unofficial de-expedition uh, with any of our radios back then. And uh, then a lower corner is a little thing that says Ellicraft Kool-Aid drinker, official Kool-Aid drinker using that uh, trademark Kool-Aid uh, picture of the little guy of, of, a, of the uh, drink on top of the radio, one of our customers put together. Uh, we never made an official one out because we didn't want to violate the trademark, but uh, uh, people uh, were proud of that. We saw those show up on some t-shirts at Dayton one year, which was sort of fun. This is another group of crazy customers actually over in Europe. Um, they, you can't really tell from this picture probably um, over YouTube, but the, um, each of the frequency displays, the last four digits, they dialed up as the serial number of their K2s that they built or the KX1 on the right side and the K1 on the left side there. Um, and they actually um, had brought these and sent the picture to us so we could uh, see that they had them all together and then got them going. Interesting thing, we didn't obscure our serial numbering uh, scheme so you could see where you were in the sequence. And people were very proud of that. They walk up, introduce myself. Hi, I'm W6XYZ uh, K2 serial number uh, 2321 or something like that. And they would do that and have them on their t-shirts and everything. So we've maintained that uh, same um, pattern for all of our radios. And it, uh, it's sort of neat, people can sort of track where they are. So in 2000, we did the 100-watt version of the K2. We weren't just a QRP company. That was just how to get started and, and go after a, a target audience that we knew was looking for some new products initially. But we knew the 100 market was very important to us to survive as we grew and you know broaden out to the, the broader ham radio market. What we didn't realize is that would kick the K2 into um, the de-expedition world much more heavily. And uh, because of its received performance, um, ALRL had given it a very high rating 
and certainly for a kit, which is, you know, like the old Heath kits, they didn't expect this to uh, be a super high performance radio, but it actually got up near the top, at the top of the charts for a while. And for a number of years was the radio of choice for a lot of people. And uh, we even had people building them for other people who couldn't build a radio just so they could get the radio, which was sort of neat. So this shows the 100 watt cover on top of a K2. You could upgrade over time with the radio, which a lot of our people did. Here's the K1 we came out with after that. And I'm going to speed up a little bit so we can get to the Q&A session afterwards here. I'll walk through these real quick. This was a four band QRP only radio. You could actually receive off a nine volt battery for a while, but not transmit, but it did have an internal AA battery or external. Still quite popular. We don't make it anymore, but it had a really nice uh, smooth sounding receiver. So that was nice portable radio. This was one of our first, uh, our second date, and I think uh, that's Wayne on the left, myself, and my wife, Lerma, kd 6 a and h she's a retired semiconductor engineer. And that is Gary Cerency, the first uh, support engineer we had uh, with us at the show. So that was our total crew uh, at the show. I think we left two people back at the factory <laughs> while we were there. So we weren't super large, but it was a very successful show in our single booth, Dayton booth there. As we grew though, in 2002, we moved out of that into uh, initially one suite and then two, then three, then four, then five in a complex that was actually above a grocery shopping store area down below, but this is an outdoor sort of office complex. And uh, we were rolling carts back and forth as we assembled things and had engineering in one, one suite and, and uh, sales and marketing and admin in another one and production test and inventory in another one. It was, a, it was quite an interesting operation. We were there uh, for quite a while, at least up until I think uh, 2008 or nine, that time frame. But we introduced the K K3 in this complex. Our next radio though was the KX1, which is our first trail friendly radio with the controls on top. Uh, still uh, very sought after, and uh, it's been superseded by the KX2 now, which is similar design, but with all modes, sideband. This was CW only, though it could receive sideband, and that was in 2004. So we're starting to broaden our line out at that point. But then we came out with the, 2000, the uh, K3 in 2007, and we had to outdo the K2, and uh, uh, surprisingly, we, we did, and it, it was extremely successful. We made this one both factory assembled and kit, and that really exploded for us the size of the company and our success. And of course, uh, it's become a standard for the expeditions and contesting and, um, and it sort of set our reputation over the years. And so each time we do a new radio, of course, we have to do a little better, but this, uh, this one has uh, been very popular over the years. I'm sure a lot of you have these too. Here's our first test production area. So um, Renee on the left, who's still with us, uh, Dale, who's uh, passed away now, unfortunately, in the middle, and uh, Vic were the first three senior techs that we had that uh, basically brought up every single radio we shipped for quite a while. And we added a few extra guys to help them in terms of the final test. But uh, you can see their test stations there with SIG gens, scopes, and, and computers. We actually eventually uh, computer uh, controlled most of the test stuff with these guys supervising it to so speed up the testing. And uh, it's come quite a way since these early days, but that's what it looked like. Followed that with the KPA 500, uh, 500 watt solid state amp. Still to this day, it's a great successful product for us and it just as a brick, it just keeps running. It has linear supply for simplicity and the same size as the K3. And that was the K, we call it the K line uh, with echoes back to the old Collins S line. And that's the P3 pan adapter in the middle that's a FFT DSP based pan adapter, uh, very high performance for the K3. And works with other radios too. It'll work with a lot of different IF frequencies. At the K3 kicked us in the larger quarters. This is where we are now, down in Watsonville. We moved in in 2012 actually. And uh, we've taken over more and more of this building. I think we're about half of it now um, for our engineering, production, test, marketing, uh, warehouse uh, facilities. Engineers are still spread both there and up and down the West Coast. So we've got uh, quite a crew uh, spread outside the factory too. Next, the KX3 in 2011-12. This is a really big first soda successful radio for us. So the KX1 was doing it too. But this was all mode up through six meters, 160 through six. Still sell them, um, it runs data modes, CW, sideband, built-in paddle if you want, or mic, uh, plug into it. And uh, of course we added things like a little pan adapter to it, the PX3, 100 watt amp. So people even use these for home stations. Getting a little more sophisticated as we did this stuff over time. Remote controlling the K3, we did a remote control panel called the K30. It's become a standard for a lot of remote stations. Uh, the remotehamradio.com guys used them and uh, remote hams, uh, from branding, KG6YPI also has these uh, tight m to k 3s on his free network that people use. And a lot of folks have their home stations controlled with these still to this day. Then we did the K3S, next thing. We had to get even a little more performance out of the K3, which we did and pump the phase noise down even further and got more performance close in and, and uh, gave some more, uh, more life to the radio. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we kept selling the uh, K3S all the way up until 
this last year, um, just before, uh, actually in 2019, the 19, thinking back now, I think it was, yeah, 2019, um, just before Dayton, we, um, we discontinued it and uh, introduced the K4. And that shows the pan adapter on the right there in operation. Nice leak, but a great review from QST. So we've worked really hard to do that. And of course, also from the RSGB from you guys. So it, uh, we keep trying to uh, push these little higher performance sheets time. It's always a challenge to do that, but it's getting up there now where it's, uh, you're, you're hitting some ceilings, but uh, your performance set is really important to us. So we shrunk the KX3. The KX2 is really sort of the standard for soda stuff now. Now here we squeezed down to the same size as the KX1. I don't know if I have a picture of them together, but. Uh, they're almost exactly the same case size, but this one has a full um, SDR-based receiver like the, the KX, uh, K3 has and the K3S. This one was direct IQ conversion to baseband and, and directly into DSP. And we sell a ton of these and they're by far, they were the first radio to get uh, quickly to 5,000 radios, much quicker than anything else we had in our past radios. And we, I don't, I've lost track of how many of these we sold over the years. And of course, you see the soda guys uh, on them quite a bit uh, operating. Um, this is the day we introduced it at, uh, we literally introduced it at Dayton in 2016 and we were mobbed and we have a 40 foot long booth and we could barely <laughs> move the whole time there. Uh, you see Lisa, who was our head of uh, sales and inside admin there with her hands up over the air. I think her computer had just crashed and uh, she was bringing it back up. And of course, everybody wanted to keep ordering the lines kept getting longer. This actually was a calm period where you could actually see the table. They, people were standing up and surrounding it for the first three or four hours we were there. We even had some guys uh, put a walkie-talkie antenna on it, and there's a built-in microphone in the KX2. And this fellow put this picture on Twitter, and we saw this uh, on, on there, and finally found out who it was, and he gave us permission to post it. But uh, he was walking around talking to people, I think, on 20 meters inside the uh, Dayton Hamvention with it. I also operate mobile with the KX2. You can see that above the uh, Kenwood Tribander there. 100 watt uh, amplifier, KXP100, my amplifier, and a uh, little RAV4 that I drive around. Also for soda, if you guys know uh, Emil um, DL8JJ, big mountaineer and also soda guy, and he has both these radios, KX2 and KX3, and he's been carrying those up mountains for now years and uh, has uh, just done amazing stuff with him. Of course, uh, you'll hear a lot of soda guys with him. And also uh, WG0AT, they call him the goat man because he brings some pack of goats with him in Colorado where he lives. And uh, that's him with a KX2 actually on the cover of QST back in 2016. KPA 1500, we uh, stretched the KPA 500, follow solid state. We've got thousands of these out there now and uh, they've done extremely well for us too. So we've covered the whole QRP and high-end QRO range now at this point. So quickly on the K4, I'm gonna go through this quick. I'm not gonna uh, dwell on it too long, but this is our latest and greatest. Um, we are shipping them now. Um, we finally uh, got production turned on after all the disruption this year with COVID and uh, fires in California smoke and uh, you name it. Uh, and of course the production uh, disruptions from that, both in terms of suppliers to us and our own stuff with the uh, engineers uh, having to, you know, one couple of cases lost homes and also people defending their homes to make sure they didn't lose them and dealing with the smoke and everything else. But that's all cleared out now. We're sort of back to normal, beautiful clear day here in Monterey Bay today. Um, so this is the K4. Uh, I'm gonna jump through this really quick so I don't take too long, but uh, it's on our webpage also, so we can talk about it there. Basically, it's a high performance 160 through six meter radio. We have also room for an internal VHF UHF module, so you'll see that coming out. Um, dual receive in all of our versions, uh, dual pan adapters if you want, or single pan adapter, you can switch it back and forth. Uh, you don't need crystal filters in the K4 and the K4D, it's all high performance uh, DSP filtering, direct sampling, and uh, user adjustable transmit receive equalizers. Of course, a high res color touch screen, though you don't have to use it for everything. Um, you've got good physical buttons also. I like that on a radio. We actually improved them over the K3S and K3. You have physical buttons behind them that click and a harder rubber uh, buttons on there that are very rugged, don't wear out and give you a nice tactile feedback too, which I like. Um, also, by the way, we changed the audio and actually have got wonderful feedback from contesters and uh, guys operating DX chasing and stuff. The fatigue factor with this radio is even, is this, you know, K3 was not a bad radio at all, but this is just noticeably better than a lot of radios, including the K3 out there. If you're in a contest for a long period of time, the fatigue factor they reported to us is much less. And uh, for instance, in cases we were at the other end of a pileup, we had the California QSO party this last weekend, for instance, and a number of people in our field test group had their friends that had not used the K4 operating it. 
And their first comment was unprompted after a number of hours of operations, hey, I can pull more people out of the pileups calling them since they were the W6 calls in the, uh, in the uh, QSO party um, than they've been able to do with other radios or even the K3. So that was, that was an incredible uh, piece of feedback. So that worked out well for us. We we're glad to see that work well too. Here's an actual picture of the K4 close up. And you can see it in dual pan adapter mode here um, on two bands. So at the K4D, you can add a second A to D converter, which gives you optimal two band reception off two different antennas or diversity reception if you want to. And, or you can just uh, specialize have one full pan adapter here. We also drive external HDMI monitor. So it, uh, it lets you uh, have a copy of this screen or just the pan adapter. So it can be a specialized pan adapter screen and we'll have other apps for it uh, externally too. Here's a close up of the screen. We do have some touchscreen stuff for adjustment. You can actually hit the band button and bring up band stacking register buttons. And, uh, but for the most part, everything's at the top level and uh, menus are mostly for setup of the radio, not for everyday operating. So it, it's pretty quick for setting things up to where you like it. And then you can just operate like you would with a K3 or any other radio. Last of the feature list, and then I'll get on to some other fun stuff here, but uh, low signal delay processing with a very fast DSP processor, full speed uh, QSK break in CW, and of course, data modes and sideband are, are seamless. Uh, diode switch like our radios for all our other radios for TR, so it uh, is very quiet. And uh, also we've got some new uh, special noise reduction we're bringing out for it. And uh, of course, external 10 megahertz reference if you wanna lock it to an external GPS reference standard in the radio too. I won't go through every connector on the back, but they're all back there. You've got multiple antenna inputs. If you've got uh, the antenna tuner in the radio, you have five separate antenna sources. You can switch to each of the two receivers independently, which is nice. And also we have ethernet, USB, um, of course the legacy uh, IO from the K3S also. And even RS-232, they can all be operated. For instance, you can have RS-232 commands coming into the radio. Um, you can be talking to it over a computer, over USB-B, um, or even doing stuff over the uh, USB-A connectors. And they all can take, you know, the Ethernet, they all can take commands simultaneously and be talking to different programs and stuff. So pretty powerful. And of course, remote control over the Ethernet too, um, over USB also uh, can be done. I'm going to jump over this just because we're running out of time. Um, I want to get the questions, but uh, there's the uh, KPA 1500 next to the K4. You've got uh, basically exactly the same size. When we came out with the KPA 1500. We had not announced the K4. People wanted to know why we picked that size for the RF deck on the 1500. And now you know. Wanted to make sure they matched so we had a new K-line uh, with these two radios. And the radio is upgradable. I won't go through all the details here, but basically you can buy a basic K4 and then add the additional A to D converters in the K4D or go for a little more blocking dynamic range with the K4HD, which is an additional superhead front end for it. One last thing here on the K4. Um, this was right before Dayton, before we announced the radio. It was sort of a teaser shot we put on Twitter. And this was me sitting with the K4 up in the corner. We didn't say it was there, but there it was. And just said, Eric, looking at the new products, we're bringing it to uh, Dayton. And I had a tablet with me showing remote control using the same UI from the K4. It's not a full-fledged remote control app. We took that same screen you see on the K4 and compiled it on a Windows Surface tablet. And I was able to touch and control the screen. It was real time. And actually, we could take another K4. And we had that and this tablet control the, the radio at the show. And we've shown that a number of times to people. And as we uh, develop that, we'll eventually have a K4-0, if you want to call it that, uh, remote panel for the K4 to look and operate just like the radio with pan adapter and everything coming over Ethernet. So a couple of fun things here, and um, then we'll wrap into questions. Um, lots of the expedition people. The lower right-hand corner actually was the first one, VP6DX, that took our first K3s out when we were still in that over-the-grocery store set of suites. And uh, we we're a little scared, but they uh, worked a new record number of contacts with those and set the, the uh, you know, the popularity of the radio for all the other de-expeditioners, which you'll see here. Certainly things like this is the Heard Island de-expedition back in uh, 2016. Um, this is the uh, South Sandwich Islands, South Georgia Islands. Those are those orange tents that almost got blown off, off the islands uh, near the end. We almost lost all the radios, but they set some new records and uh, were very successful. Uh, also the South Orkney Islands twice and a whole bunch of other de-expeditions, of course. So you'll see K3s and our other radios out there. I like a little simpler de expeditions. This is one of my operating positions on a uh, trip out in the middle of the South Pacific. And so uh, for me, it's usually a KX3 or KX2 with uh, simple antennas over the water and uh, still working a lot of stations, which is great. A little more relaxing too. You can sit outside if you want and have something cool to drink. This is the same location. I think this was north of Tahiti uh, back a number of years ago. And uh, we have a little fun too once in a while also, which is great. So 
open it up for questions. Um, anything people want to ask, uh, I guess uh, one of the moderators here is going to pull them off of uh, YouTube or whatever you guys have, but uh, I'll uh, put some more time in here, at least until we uh, run out of time and they kick me off. We probably got about uh, 10, 15 minutes and I'd be glad to answer questions for you on anything. And uh, I'll put some links up here too, in terms of ways to contact us uh, via, of course, uh, the web, email, Twitter, RSGB, of course, uh, for your RSGB information too. But thanks a lot and let's go with some questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric. It's mother. K4 looks gorgeous, I have to say. Um, lots of questions coming in actually. Uh, Richard uh, G4HGI wants to know your secret for being so chipper at this time of the morning or the time of the morning it is with you. What about one o'clock? Yeah, it's morning, about, it? uh, gosh, what is it now? It's 1.38 in the morning a.m. In, in California. So yeah, uh, we also uh, we also have Bob W06W in California watching uh, uh, this morning as well. Wow. Uh, right, questions. Gregory M0ODZ, thanks you for being the keynote uh, speaker. And um, he wants to know uh, uh, how much do you have to keep an eye on? Uh, oh no, that's not that's not his question. That's another that's another question. Uh, I'll come back to Gregory's question in in a moment. But. Um, you were saying that uh, you do listen to customers and they give you feedback and then and then you act on it uh and i was going to ask you how much what sort of things you've you've changed uh, because of because of that but wow. uh, robert walker robert walker <laughs> has uh, a message to say the new russian 599 tx 500 is a challenger to the kx2 uh, as it's claimed to be more rugged and environmentally uh, and environmental and environment proof how will you respond to that product in your own offering? Any thoughts on okay. that? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's, uh, I've looked at that radio, though I haven't actually uh, used it myself. And uh, is that the one that's actually hogged out, has the case hogged out of a piece of aluminum? I forget which one it is. Um, but uh, I think that from a performance standpoint, we still outperform it in terms of receiver performance on the KX2. Um, generally also, um, you know, one of our probably strengths here you mentioned that we listen to the customers well we're continually adding features to the radio based on feedback from the customers um we've added different filtering capabilities for instance data modes things like that over the years um and basically uh you know, lots of things that make it easier to use certainly from a soda standpoint um kx2 actually has, is a fairly rugged radio it's not um you know totally waterproof or anything like that though actually um uh, an add-on product from side kx which is uh Scott uh, has a company in the States that makes those little add-on uh, side panels and a clip-on uh, waterproof cover for the radio has uh, really made it uh, for the guys around outdoors and soda and things like that even better. And so from a ruggedness standpoint, we do very well, though we've actually even had uh, the special forces like the Green Berets and people like that uh, in the States uh, independently, they buy them as off the shelf. It's not a government contract, but they'll buy five or 10 at a time for their, uh, their battalion groups and stuff. And they, um, they're using them in, in some pretty nasty areas. Um, they hook up their encrypted stuff to it and do what they're going to do. But um, I'm not too worried from a ruggedness standpoint. And obviously, power drain, um, the ability to um, you know, have a small radio that's reliable uh, with internal lithium batteries like we do, but also um, have reasonably good receiver performance. And the KX2 absolutely does. Um, I think we'll hold it pretty well. We're not seeing a dent in sales. KX2 sales have actually gone up. Um, and actually KX3, the same thing, and over, actually we had strong sales throughout the COVID uh, crisis here, even when we were shut down for a number of weeks uh, in California, um, back during the, uh, the spring here. Um, we actually, KX2 and KX3 sales kept coming in and um, when we came back and there, we had a big backlog, we still do actually, we had even stronger orders. So at this point, I don't think it's a big problem. Uh, we certainly will watch that, see if there's something they're doing we, we have to react to, but I haven't seen anything we have to do really heavily yet at this okay. point. Dave, GM0HVS wants to know if there's any possibility of a replacement for the K2 uh, that can be built rather than assembled. He says, I like my KX3, but I love my K2. Well, the K2, we're still selling. Uh, I think it will be as soon as I can keep getting parts for it. It's a through hole, you know, 160 through a 10 meter uh, side end CW transceiver. Um, we're not re-engineering that right now. It may happen someday. Uh, especially if we run out of parts uh, that, that are through hole for it that we can get. Uh, problem is that if we go surface mount, uh, it's really not practical to make a surface mount kit at that scale for that complex radio. Uh, the economics work out, it's almost more expensive to make that than assemble it. 
um, because the parts are so small, we have to individually bag and handle them. A lot of them aren't even marked because they're mainly made for a computer, you know, for mechanical uh, or robotic assembly. So we, um, and we would have to actually do something like we do with the K4 or the K3 and K4, where the boards are pre-assembled and tested. It's more of an assembly operation. But in light of that, we're going to try, the through hole parts are still available for a lot of these things. We may have some small boards that have a microprocessor and other things that are surface mount only pre-mounted um, in the future. That's one thing we've talked about. And then you get to do all the rest of the soldering and bring up with the radio. So, but the K2, you still have that experience and we still have people buying them and, you know, get every option possible for it to uh, have that building experience. And so we're going to try to keep doing that. It's amazing. We've had that radio going for over 20 years now, but um, I'm not announcing anything new. They're not going to replace it short term. Uh, obviously, we've got our hands full. We'll just getting the K4 ramped up now. It's going to be dominating us for the next uh, six to 12 months. So you're not going to see a, a KX4 or, or a KX2 on steroids at this point. You'll see software changes and, and enhancements on those, but uh, uh, you never know in the future. We'll see. You've just answered Gregory Fenton's uh, question. Uh, you said, what's next for Craft uh, apart from some well-deserved <laughs> sleep? Is there a watch this space moment coming up? So no, I guess is the, uh, is uh, well, the answer never, there. We, might, we, we never tell you until we get there. We might surprise you. But uh, <laughs> at this point, I'd say really realistically right now, um, you're going to see K4, K4 enhancements, add-ons, uh, remote control panels, those types of things over the next year. Um, and I think we'll have our hands full, to be honest. That's a, it's, you know, we've got a huge backlog on that, and uh, we want to obviously keep that satisfied first. And we're not seeing a problem with the KX2s and KX3s. Now, that said, um, every time a new radio gets announced, you always see an impact for a month or two where people sort of pause and say, what's this other radio about? And then uh, what's interesting is then the sales come right back to where they were, or even better sometimes. So uh, those radios have had a lot of staying power, and we tend to keep our radios going for a long time because they're designed using some pretty good technology. But um, that said, if there's an opportunity to do something cool, we'll, we'll do it, but I can't say when. Okay, um, nice to see call signs, by the way, on your questions, if you could possibly can. Uh, one from, it just says Tristan's workbench. Uh, why was the first Elecraft radio called a K2 rather than a K1? Uh, Were there plans okay. for a K1 at the time? Oh, sorry, it's uh, G0KAY. Okay, uh, that, thank you. It's a, that's a story I've told a few times, I'll be real quick, but when we first announced it at that uh, Pacificon uh, meeting back in 1997, we were all talking about what's going to happen in, in the year 2000 with, uh, you know, uh, computer clocks rolling over and not having enough bits uh, or, you know, bytes to properly do that and thinking programs are going to crash and we're going to have some kind of disaster. And, uh, but also we were thinking about mountaintops and uh, like K2 and um, um, are we going to, and so we are 2K either way. But uh, we probably st we stayed away from uh, 2K <laughs> because that sounded too much like the 2000 deal. We were thinking mostly mountaintops, so um, we uh, we called it the K2, and uh, and went with that. We I just, it was just really wasn't thinking a sequence at that time. But of course, uh, we had the K1 come out afterwards, which was smaller scale, so it was a smaller number going down, and then we had um, of course the KX line of products, the KX1, KX3, and then KX2. Um, KX2 being a smaller version of the KX3, so you can sort of see the numbers going that way. So that's sort of how our numbering scheme worked on those. And then of course, the K, uh, but the KX meant X for extreme. Um, so for the uh, portable radios and then the soda type radios, that's how those came about. So that's how the K2 came. It was, uh, it was not uh, thought of the sequence at the time. Okay, questions are coming thick and fast now, so we'll have to uh, belt through these. Um, Mike, G4, G4 CDF says, do you have any plans for a VHF UHF? Rig similar to the IC9700? Not in the short term. Um, the market's been pretty well served, obviously, by, by ICOM and some of the other guys in that area. But uh, like I said, you'll see the K4 with a pretty good performance uh, VHF, UHF module, and we can build it different ways. It could be uh, 70, uh, you know, 70 megahertz, 4 meters, and 2 meters, or it might be 2 meters in UHF. Uh, we've got the capability of doing a number of things with that module. So. Uh, you'll probably see that first from us in terms of VHF, UHF work. Um, it's a little hard in the VHF, UHF market um, and to really be competitive with um, the main suppliers and that just because the um, overall cost of the products are, are pushed down quite a bit. Um, and it's, uh, it's a lot harder unless you can really carve out a performance niche that people are willing to pay for there. And it's, it's our observation is, is it's, not going to be super easy if we were doing it as a standalone radio versus part of a radio like the K4. 
through all these questions, but uh, John Earnshaw, M0JFE, says, uh, as now we're seeing SDR radio equipment becoming accessible to more people with a smaller budget, what do you see as being the next step for radio after SDR? <laughs> Boy, um, I think you'll see the SDR part staying around for quite a while. You'll see the performance go up um, as analog to digital converters get better, uh, logic gets faster. Uh, we can do some more creative things with it uh, and get more performance out of it in terms of even more dynamic range and do some other things with it in terms of wider bandwidth modes. Um, so you'll see that. One of the things we designed in the K4, so it's uh, not going to be obsoleted quickly if new parts do come out, is the what we call digital down converters, which are where we literally digitally sample at RF at the operating frequency, say 14 megahertz if you're on 20 meters or 28 megahertz uh, if you're on, uh, on 10 meters or so on. Uh, and we directly sample that at 122 megahertz right now with a uh, very high speed analog to digital converter and then digitally down converted on that single little card. Uh, but say a whole whiz bang new uh, set of parts come out uh, four years, five years from now, we can keep the radio and upgrade it like we did uh, with things on the K4, K3 to a K3S. We could have a K4S, for instance, and also you know, sell upgrades to people that have the K4s, which makes you know, our radios attractive to people because they can get a lot of lifetime out of it. So I think you'll see that. I don't think the DSP part's gonna go away. We've been using DSP for a lot of things, demodulation ever, ever since uh, the K3 days. And uh, certainly inside the KX2s and, um, and KX3, we use them also. So I don't think the DSP is gonna go away. I think you'll see faster and more creative uh, software implementations in terms of features we add to it. And of course, you know, newer parts. We've got uh, a talk on DSP coming up later on the more about, learn more about uh, stream from uh, William Eustace. Um, but we're reaching the end of our time now, uh, Eric. Um, just before, you did say uh, in, in your talk that this is a business for you, not, not a hobby. But do, oh, you actually hobby. Get, do you actually get time to play? Yeah, I've got a whole radio shack down uh, here in the, in the bottom floor of the house. I'm on the side of a hill here, about a mile from the ocean. And the uh, basement I, I built out um, on that, it's like half the width of the house down there because we're on sort of at, at edge of a pretty good sized slope hill and uh, put a good size ham shack in there years ago. And uh, that's my lab and ham shack and occasionally my office uh, high down there. But I, um, I get on and operate. I've been operating actually uh, just this afternoon. I was on a little bit too. Um, I uh, you know, do everything from just making sure I'm using our radios and so I can see what works and what doesn't work to my satisfaction. Um, actually, <laughs> I inadvertently worked with somebody at FTA today. I wasn't even trying to, I was just watching them and I. I was uh, moving my mouse around and inadvertently clicked on the signal and little did I know I already had worked in my time it was over. That was pretty funny. But uh, no, I get um, on, I'm, I'm, I operate CWM side meeting too. I'm sorry, I don't know we're getting time, time. Go ahead, I'm sorry. That's great, yeah. Just one final question from everybody. When will we see the, K, uh, the K4 and how much? Okay. Um, Pricing over in Europe uh, usually is, of course, you can you can buy directly from us and ship. You've got to pay your import duty uh, coming into the country that way. Um, but uh, the CE testing that we do, we've actually done the preliminary testing already. We usually have to wait until the final production units are rolling off the line and make sure we go through a full test on that. It's not something you submit to a government agency, which is nice. There's not that bureaucratic delay. So. Um, we basically go through the test lab and just catch any uh, minor things that are specific to CE that maybe we have to tweak um, on the radio just to make sure they're happy with that. Um, obviously, we, we design the radios to be clean in terms of emissions and stuff. And that's the key thing with CE. Uh, because there's not 110 volt supply in it, we don't have to go through the whole high voltage part of it that you do for like the linear amplifiers that we sell. But uh, it, uh, it should go pretty quickly. I'd say we'll probably have that complete over the next uh, 60 to 90 days, and you'll probably see them starting to pop up in Europe in that time frame, maybe even faster. I'm trying to push it as fast as we can, but we've got our hands full with the uh, current backlog, which is primarily uh, uh, not in Europe-based, unless they were you know, buying them in the States and carrying them over. Um, but um, the, uh, I'd say in that time frame over the next, next 90 days, you'll see them probably start um, some popping up over in Europe. Uh, if people may be the place to sort of a put me in line but not in official order um and uh and then uh, they'll come back and take it as soon as we start shipping that's great 
that's uh, I'm sure everybody were really interested to see those arrive here. Well, Eric, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us in the middle of your night uh, and giving us a fascinating insight into the all the goings on at uh, Ellicraft. Uh, we really appreciate it. Again, you'll have to imagine the round of applause that's uh, ringing out now around the uh, around the globe. Uh, really, uh, you're welcome to stay and uh, watch the proceedings, but I guess uh, there's sleep to catch up on there. So, all the streams will be will, they will be available later in the day. By the way, but thank. Thanks very much, Eric. All the best to you. Okay. 73 from us here.